at the end of the day, recovery is really about rest and relaxation. And so anything that you can do that will help you relax and sort of feel rejuvenated, that is recovery. And we can count that as working. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, Who loves to sing It's Raining Men, the Jerry Hallowell version, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 102 of the Running For Real podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Last week, I had my friend and mentor, Nick Anderson, on the podcast. And if you're training for a marathon right now, that episode was pure gold and included many of the things that are probably what are missing from your training right now. Even if you're not marathon training, a lot of the principles will apply to you as well. Now today we have a repeat guest on, but she's one who's here to talk about something most runners are obsessed with, and she's been doing a lot of work on the topic since we last talked. Christy Ashwanden is here to talk about recovery, and if you're someone who does tend to get a lot of recovery products and services, you will find her book good to go, and this episode for that matter, fascinating. Now, I mentioned last week that I'm conducting a survey right now to help find out what I can do to make this podcast even better and just learn a little bit more about you, really, because actually, I don't know as much as I should. And I wish I could get to know each of you as much as you have got to know me, but that's probably not realistic when there are more than 10,000 of you (laughs) each episode. But this will help me get one step closer and match it to more of what you want. So go to tinamuir.com forward slash survey, or you can find a link in the show notes. So Christy is here. She's a writer for 538, The Washington Post, Outside Online, and many more. And one quick thank you before we get to the episode. I want to thank everyone who has purchased my book and left a review on Amazon or shared it on your social media. You, my friends, make my heart swell. Thank you so, so much for that. It means the world. And if you're not in an ideal financial situation right now, I understand $15 or $12.99 for the Kindle version may be too much to commit to right now. But I do have a Patreon page and even a few dollars you can contribute. So you can do that and support and just kind of show the love. So thank you so much to everyone who is already a Patreon supporter. You are wonderful. All right, let's go meet Christy. Christy, thank you so much for joining me back on the Running For Real podcast. I am so excited to have you back here. It's been just over a year, uh, maybe 15 months since I last had you on. Since then, you have written a book, but welcome back to the show. Thanks. And you've had a baby since the last time we talked. (laughs) Yeah, I guess, was I uh, September 2017? So I was pregnant. Yes, you, I would have been were, pregnant. Yeah, yes, okay. you were visibly pregnant at the time. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You saw like a little a little body moving around on yeah. the belly while we're talking, but no, yeah. not quite that much. But um, okay, so we're going to talk about your book, Good to Go, mm-hmm. which we're going to talk about soon. But what else have you been up to in the meantime? Um, well, the book has been taking most that of takes my time. No time at all, right? You yeah, just, right. it just takes a few seconds. Anyway, yeah. sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, I sort of thought, okay, I'm gonna you finish the book, and then and there there really was this nice pause in between, you know, the book was finished and publication, but then all of a sudden, when the book is coming close to publication date, there mm-hmm. are all these other things to do, and yeah, you know, this is one of them. I have been doing podcast interviews almost on a daily basis. There's radio interviews, media interviews, and yeah, you know, these are all nice. Problems problems to have, but wow, it's, you know, it can sure eat up a day. So. Oh yeah, easily. Um, and you know, but I'm sure that it's something that is enjoyable, but like you said, it it's, it's a lot. And especially at a time when you've been working really hard on yeah. a book and you've kind of mentally fatigued yourself in the similar way to you would with a race. Um, it's, it's probably quite a lot to be doing things like that. So let's talk about the book. So good to go. What the athlete in all of us can learn, sh- learn from the strange science of recovery. So starting with that, what made you decide to write a book about recovery? Um, you know, for those listening who are thinking, yeah, yeah, another book on recovery, we get it. What makes this one different? 
Yeah. So I've often heard it's, it's sort of common advice that's given to writers that you should write the book you want to read. Mm. And I think that uh, Good to Go is the book I wish had when I was a serious athlete um, competing. It's the book that, you know, if I had had back then, I think I could have avoided some of the problems. I was prone to overtraining. And I think that this is really common among runners in particular. We're so driven. And so you think, oh, I just need to train more. And when things aren't going well, or you're feeling fatigued. You think, okay, I just need to double down. And I really did that to my own detriment mm-hmm. during my athletic career. And so, you know, a lot of it is just lessons learned that I want to share with, with other people. Um, but it's also, it was, it was an opportunity for me to sort of combine two of my obsessions, which one of which of course is running and sport. I'm also a a cyclist and a cross country skier. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's something that I'm passionate about and interested in, but I've also become very interested in recent years. Um, I'm a science journalist by, by trade, and I write a lot about, uh, different studies and things like this. And so I've become really interested and almost obsessed with the scientific method and with methodology within science. And this is some pretty wonky stuff. And I know mm-hmm. I can already hear you and your, your readers are probably there or your listeners, their eyes are probably glazing over <laughs> right now. And so it sounds really boring, but these things are really important. You know, the way that studies are conducted, the way statistics are done can really affect the outcome of a study. Absolutely. And so um, I, as I started looking into the research on sport, I started realizing that that a lot of the, the studies had some, some sort of common problems. And these weren't things, this is not an issue of researchers in the field being terrible scientists or trying mm-hmm. to deceive people. I mean, there, there may be a few examples of that, but I think fundamentally what it is, is that sport and, and performance is really hard to study and recovery is especially so. Sort of the first problem that you run into is how do we even re- define recovery. Yeah, you know, we true. all know that it's important. You know, so so I'll just ask you this, Tina, if you were going to do a study to measure recovery, how would you measure it? I mean, it would have to be performance, wouldn't it? Right, right. But it's hard. It's like, okay, so do you do a time trial? Do you do, um, you know, some sort of intervals? Are you looking at heart rate? Are you looking at, you know, VO2, something like that? There are all, there are all these measures that you might look at, um, lactate clearance, things like this. Um, but it's hard. One, one thing I learned while researching this book is that there isn't one single measure that you can find that really defines recovery, at least not something that is quantitative. In other words, something that you can see on your sports watch or heart rate monitor or something yep. like that. Um, What I actually found is that the very best measure um, metric for recovery is actually just the answer to the question, how are you feeling? So it turns out that our brains are really sophisticated. They sort of take all of the inputs that our body is giving it and turn that into a feeling. So if you feel fatigued, if you feel sore, if you feel sluggish, that really is your body telling you something. And I think the most important thing that an athlete can learn is how to read those those signals. And they're pretty individual. So, you know, Tina, what, what might for you be a symbol that you're tired or that you're sort of going over the edge and need to back off on your training might be completely different than what it is for me. And so Absolutely. it's not something that a coach can just say, okay, here's the thing. It's something that every athlete has to, to determine for herself. And that's what makes it tricky. Yeah. Well, a a few things with that one. I absolutely agree. I mean, some people seem to get sick very easily. I know Steve seems to get, every time he gets run down, he appears to have a cold, but it's not a a contagious cold. It just seems to be like a run down cold. But for me, I start getting little injuries appear and and there's differences with that. But also, Christy, I'd love to hear with that. How much of that you said the, the, the best kind of indicator is how are you feeling? But I don't Mm -hmm. know about you, but I've come across a lot of different, um, like mindsets, attitudes, maybe from athletes, you know, we all know that person who you ask them how they're feeling and no matter what, they're like, yeah, I'm great. I feel good. I feel strong. Like they Mm -hmm. always will respond with that positive, even if they are not feeling great. Um, I think Sarah Crouch, um, who's a good friend of mine has talked a lot about this, about she's one of those people that says, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Whereas I'm someone who's kind of like, ah, ah, I'm, I'm struggling so much. Oh my God, what am I going to do? Like, and, um, so I think even within that, that makes it even more difficult because you have to be able to admit to yourself, even what you're saying that recognizing what your weakness is, but also being able to say it out loud. You know what? I am actually feeling quite tired or yeah, that is sickness from, um, 
you know, not recovering or being tired rather than, oh, that stupid child gave me a cold or whatever it is, but right. actually recognizing <laughs> that it is you yeah. doing something. Did you find that as well? Or, or Yeah, I have. And I, I think you raise a really good point. And that is, I think we all have different sort of outlooks and philosophies about things. And you sort of describe, you know, one person being sort of like, everything's fine. Everything's fine. I'm just going to, you know, tell myself everything's fine. And that can be great. Sometimes it can also be sort of maladaptive. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I think most runners have also had the situation where you're like, oh no, my hamstring's fine. I didn't really, it's not really, I don't need to take a day off. Mm -hmm. No, everything's fine. This little injury is nothing. Um, you know, so you, that, sort of attitude can be to your detriment. On the other hand, you know, you describe feeling like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, everything sort of feels like a catastrophe and that's sort of the other end of the spectrum, right? And that can be very good when you're sensing true things that are like, Mm -hmm. okay, really, I have a problem here. I need to take a day off or, you know, I need to pay attention, but it can also be sort of detrimental when you're just sort of catastrophizing everything, you know? (laughs) So I think, you know, ideally you want to find a middle ground, Um, but it's also... And this is tricky because when you're training hard and you're really pushing, I mean, you are going to feel tired and you mm-hmm. are, are going to feel sore. And so the trick is figuring out, okay, when is that good feeling and how do you find like that line over which you don't want to, to go? And that's something that, again, is very individual. And I think a lot of it just comes down to checking in with yourself and paying attention to the right things and noticing how you're feeling. Mm-hmm. So I've often noticed that on race day, if I feel a little bit sluggish or, you know, I'm not feeling super great in the warm up, I often will have a great race. Yes. And so psychologically I've told myself, so it's something where I'm like, okay, I know this. And it, you know, my, I may, my body may be telling me that like, it's not ready, but I know that that's just a little, you know, I need to warm up a little bit more, maybe do some sprints, you know, just sort of, um, get some of my nervousness out, but I know that this is not a sign that things are all going to go to crap. Right. Yeah. And so, but, but again, that's something that's very individual. It's something that I've noticed for myself. I've paid attention to, I've sort of created a story around that helps me rather than hurting me. And, and, you know, if someone else may find another thing, it may be, you know, that you find, I don't, I don't know what your experience is, but, but there are things like this that are very individual that mm-hmm. really have to come from the athlete herself. Yeah. Okay, great. And and thank you for kind of explaining that as a, a starting point here, because I think this is important to note as we do go through these things. Um, so just to kind of wrap it up in a nutshell with uh, the listeners, this is a, a book where Christy, we had on uh, in September 2017, as I mentioned, to kind of be the honest one to tell us what mm-hmm. was actually going on, what she had actually found within the media on um, various topics. We did gender issues, we did doping, all kinds of different things. And so Christy has got together all these recovery tools, products, things that people talk about um, to help with recovery and kind of look to each one, as she mentioned about the science and understanding, um, you know, the studies, uh, Christy even did essentially made a study of her own and yeah. I'd love for you to start with that just to kind of really bring home that point that you said that it can be really hard to trust an individual study and and you know how it can look as if something is really impressive or not impressive but it actually might not be telling the full story or might have something else going on. Yeah. So the first chapter of my book is about beer and running. Um, I know everyone's favorite topic, right? (laughs) That's how you've enticed Uh, people in to keep reading, right? Right. (laughs) right. Um, But I think it's a pretty common thing, um, particularly with recreational runners is, you know, you go for a run with your friends and finish up um, you know, happy hour run and then finish up at the bar and have an, a nice cold beer. And yeah, this is something that can be really relaxing. It's enjoyable to be with friends. But th- the question that I had was, okay, this is, this is really fun. It feels enjoyable, but is the alcohol wrecking my recovery? You know, is this such a good thing? And, you know, we would sort of laugh and joke about how this is a recovery fuel and recovery beverage. And I'll just mention here that, that beer is, there are beers that are marketed for recovery and as Mm -hmm. sort of a replenishing beverage. Um, Most of them are non-alcoholic. You know, if you're drinking a low alcohol beer, it's pretty similar, I would say. (laughs) Anyway, so I, I, I'm a scientist by training. And so I thought, you know, the answer here is to do a study because I had looked at the scientific literature and although there were studies about sport and alcohol, none of them really felt applicable to the situation. Mm -hmm. And the question that I had, you know, that there were studies where they were giving rugby players, you know, getting them like 
totally sauced and then doing stuff. And it's like, that's not really what we're talking yeah. about here. And it was in, you know, looking at strength athletes and things like that. So anyway, I got together with some really good researchers at Colorado Mesa University and we put together a study and I was, I was part of the planning. Um, you know, the, the researchers really took the lead, but I was in on that. And it turned out that it was just a lot harder to study than I thought. Mm-hmm. You know, the first question is, how are we going to measure recovery? What kind of protocol are we going to use? Then there were sort of practical considerations. So we needed to use, you know, we were basically going to take over the exercise lab for multiple days. Um, we were asking volunteers to give up their time, you know, so did we, if we did it on two different weekends, that was two weekends they were giving up. Versus, you know, if we could figure out a protocol that we could do in a single weekend, that might be easier for the for the athletes and the participants. So anyway, um, we put together this study and I was a participant in it as well, which was really fun. Mm-hmm. But it also gave me a little bit of insight into this. So the test that so we measured multiple things looking at this. We looked at like respiration rates. We looked at some metabolic factors, heart rate, things like that. We also looked at ratings of perceived exertion. This is this is sort of in a nutshell, this question of how are you feeling? How hard mm-hmm. does it feel? Um, but then we also, our main test was this thing called a run to exhaustion. And in this, we were put on a treadmill. So we had been given a VO2 max test in advance of this. And so we were put at a pace that was at 80% of our max VO2. And just had to go until we couldn't go any longer. And so this might seem like a really great way to measure if you're recovered, because if you're not recovered, you'd expect to go less time. Mm -hmm. But what I found as a participant is that this was really felt like more of a psychological test. And it's like, okay, how, how devoted are you to this? Like, no one's getting paid. This doesn't really matter to you individually. Like, how long are you going to go? Um, And I'll just point out here that, you know, some of recovery is psychological. So I think that, you know, There is probably legitimate information to be gleaned from such a test, but it just probably in the end wasn't the best thing of the the actual thing that we were trying to measure, which is sort of like, how how good are you feeling? Are you Mm -hmm. feeling better or worse? Are you able to perform better or worse? You know, we might have been better off doing something like a time trial. I don't know. Well, even I just want to pause you for a second. Even if like, what if you'd had a bad day and maybe you have a newborn baby and they didn't sleep all night and you were like, well, I guess that would actually make that would make a difference physically, but you just had a bad day. You just had an argument with a spouse. And like you said, you're not being paid for this. It's just, yeah. and you're like, well, whatever, that's fine. And you stopped early. Whereas had you had a good day, it, you could have kept going. So yeah, I, I think that's really important you mentioned, but continue with what you're saying. Sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's also, so the other problem with our study is that it was very small. We had 10 people Mm -hmm. total, which is actually a pretty typical sample size for a lot of these studies in sports science. Mm -hmm. Um, And the problem is that you can't know with a small sample like that, it's really hard to know how representative it is. And there can be variation and it's hard to determine whether, you know, is that just natural variation? Is it an actual effect from the alcohol? Those are difficult things to determine with a small study. And so um, I'll just fast forward to our results, which were that we found that women actually performed better after they had Mm -hmm. had beer, that that beer as a recovery beverage seemed to be performance enhancing for women and uh, sort of the opposite for men. They they did worse after having the beer. And so, yeah, as someone who, uh, you know, has a a husband who, Mm yeah, it's sort of like, okay, great. You know, he can be our designated driver now. And like, this is great. Um, So it seemed like great news, but I also couldn't trust it because yeah. having been part of this, I just was skeptical, you know, is this really true? And looking at the individual results. So even though, you know, the means were, were showing this, this type of result, there's a lot of variation within the group as well. And so we had one guy who went a uh, really long time on his first test. And so was he, you know, did he quit? sooner on the second test because he was tired from the first one or was it because he had had beer afterwards? You know, it's Mm -hmm. hard, it's hard to tease out these factors. So anyway, I think that the bottom line, what I learned from this study was just that these small studies like this are interesting. Um, They offer evidence. We should look at them, but they're not definitive and we really need more than one study. And there are so many different ways that, that a particular individual small study can go wrong Mm -hmm. or, produce a misleading result. So I'll just give you another example. Um, in the the meeting before our test, we, we brought all the participants together, um, almost all of them. There are a couple of people who missed this first meeting where they were sort of briefed on how things would go. And someone asked, you know, how long 
would we be expected to last, you know, like basically about how long should we expect this run to exhaustion to take? And the researcher said, oh, about 20 minutes. And so mm. everyone who was at this, everyone who was at that meeting went at least 20 minutes. And there were a lot of people that were sort of quitting shortly after there. The, the couple of people who missed that meeting and didn't get that information did not last 20 minutes. And oh, so that seems telling, right? Yeah. And that's just a little, I call it in the book, I think I called it inadvertent nudges, but these are just little things that, that can, you know, push a, a study in one direction or another that are completely inadvertent. And this wasn't, I mean, we were so well-meaning in this study. We really wanted to get at the truth and find a good answer. Um, but I think what I found is that, you know, this was a really good start. And the next thing would be to do another study and to try and replicate it and to get a bigger sample size or, you know, look at some of the factors that we think may have accounted for what we found and mm -hmm. see if you can address them. So I think the the takeaway here is that science is not an answer. It's a process. Yes. And so it's a process of uncertainty reduction. So, you know, our study hinted that, that beer could be performance enhancing, you know, in terms of recovery for women. I would like to believe that result, um, but we need more evidence to really make it more certain. Mm -hmm. And as was the case with many of the examples that you used in the book, the things that you looked into. So the rest of the book, you kind of break down each of the areas. Um, and I thought maybe we could kind of dig into some of these and then uh, to get the full story, to get uh, all the details, you're going to have to read the book. Good to go. Um, but firstly, before we get onto that, was it fun to kind of go through and kind of debunk some of them that maybe you've been a bit like, well, that doesn't sound, you know, like it could be actually helpful. Or did you find yourself kind of going the other way that you were kind of like feeling essentially more overwhelmed afterwards because you're like, well, what can I trust? Yeah, it was a little of both. Um, I was not at all sad to learn that icing is is not helpful for recovery and isn't a good recovery strategy. Um, icing, if you've ever done it, I definitely is, you want know, to ice, talk about that one. Yep, that was yeah. On ice baths are are painful, and uh, I'm you know we'll have no regrets about not doing that again. But I also I think one of the takeaways was also that um, there are a lot of things that athletes really like and that feel good that may not have um, scientific evidence that are showing like some sort of physiological change that's really helpful. But at the end of the day, recovery is really about rest and relaxation. And so anything that you can do that will reduce your feelings of stress, mm -hmm. that will help you relax and sort of feel rejuvenated, that that's good. <laughs> you know, that, that is recovery and we can count that as working. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think one of the messages here is that a lot of the, the selling points for some of these re recovery modalities are sort of made more scientific than they are. Um, you know, something like massage is a good example of this. I think most athletes love massage. I'm a huge fan of it myself. Um, a lot of athletes get massage regularly. Um, when I looked into the science of it, there wasn't a lot of hard and fast evidence showing yeah. physiological benefits or anything, you know, and there are explanations that are sometimes given that, that didn't really pan out. Um, with the research, but at the same time, what a, what a massage does is it makes you lie still for a while. You know, yeah. you're truly, I mean, you're truly relaxing. Okay. I mean, even if you're getting a pretty rigorous sports massage, you're sort of tuning into your body. And I think that's another really important part of recovery is just really paying attention to how you're feeling. And massage has this other benefit that's sort of hard to quantify, which is it kind of helps with this body awareness, you know, so you have someone sort of pounding on you and you realize, oh, I didn't realize I was sore in that spot or, oh, look, there's a knot here that I didn't know about. And so I think that that may be, you know, in this more nebulous way, beneficial in a way that we can't measure on a physiological test. Mm -hmm. And the fact that some people fall asleep while they're getting massage, which gives you recovery right. from that aspect as well. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's very right. interesting. Okay, let's look at those two then. Um, massage. So one thing you mentioned in the book is that we sometimes feel like um, it has to be, it has to hurt to be effective. And I have fallen into this, uh, you know, so many times in the past, particularly, I remember a few occurrences um, training for my first marathon, where the massages I got from this physical therapist was so bad, like top five pains in my mm. life because it was so painful. Like my shin one day was absolutely, my whole calf was black and blue. Another Ugh. day, my whole quad was bright red from getting all the um, uh, adhesions. 
Mm-hmm. But so for me, that was kind of the thing, oh, I'm, I'm helping myself. But you found, um, you know, then I justified it as I'm flushing the toxins out. Right, um, right. What did you find about that? Because I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, there aren't toxins that need to be flushed out. So that that's a myth. There's no good evidence for that. And and I would just say that when you're looking for sort of red flags for things that probably aren't very scientific, anything that's talking about toxins and flushing them is probably probably not all it's cracked up to be. But the other thing is, so I think it's it's fine for massage to to be deep and to you know be sort of that good painful, um, but you shouldn't be coming away from it black and blue. You shouldn't mm-hmm. be feeling sick afterwards. And it is actually possible. It seems this is sort of preliminary, and I I want to hesitate before saying that this is a for sure proven fact. But there seems to be um, the possibility that like really vigorous massage can actually lead to um, muscle damage where you're mm-hmm. you're putting you know these these, um, you're, you're, you're kind of causing damage to the muscles in the same way that, you know, rhabdomyolysis. I can't say that word. I think I probably just mis- mispronounced it. It's called rhabdo. Okay. Um, I wouldn't even um, want to try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but there, there's some, there are some people, there's some preliminary evidence that perhaps a really, really deep massage could lead to this. I don't think that that's a common outcome, but I would just say that, you know, the idea that it has to really hurt to be good is probably not right. And the wrong way. I mean, the massage should really be making you feel good and make you, Mm -hmm. make you feel relaxed and relaxing the muscles. And that can be vigorous and it can be, um, you know, hard, but it shouldn't be like what you're saying where you just want to run out of there. You you should not come away from it bruised. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I was like biting a towel, like absolutely like it was, yeah, that, and I, I still have a photo. Maybe I'll put it in the show notes of of Mm -hmm. my leg look like after that. And it, looking back at it, I can still like it makes me bring back that memory very clearly. Okay. Another topic you mentioned there was icing. Now I want to bring this one to uh, the front here. If we talk about a few topics, because this is one we see over and over again. Um, I mean, I think most people know by now things like your Achilles, you don't ice, but what about everything else? It's very, very easy for people to get a pain in their knee and ice it or, um, just grab ice and put it on anything and everything that is painful. Tell us about what you actually found as this is a chapter you, you know, spent a lot of time talking about and going through things. Yeah, there's a whole chapter in the book about icing and cryotherapy and sort of all things cold related. And I guess I'll just start by saying that, you know, icing does numb things. And so if you're if what you're looking for is some numbing, if you have a knee that that hurts and putting ice on it numbs it in a way that makes it feel better, like there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but these ice baths that people do and a lot of the icing where the intent here is to reduce soreness or to improve recovery, that is actually not borne out by the studies. And in fact, there's some pretty interesting evidence that um, icing may actually impede some of the um, uh, recovery from from training. And this is because what happens when you're exercising hard, you can create this little micro damage in your muscles. And the way that your body repairs them is through the inflammation process. So inflammation is an important part of this recovery and this process. And so if you are icing and it impairs inflammation, then you can actually get less of an effect and you may um, make lesser improvements and have fewer gains from that exercise. And so the other thing that's interesting about icing is that it does seem to reduce inflammation temporarily, but it's it's not long lasting. So there's also that it's it's really a temporary thing. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'm glad that you kind of went into this. And again, I'm going to tell everyone listening to to buy the book, to go read into this one, particularly if you are someone who um, maybe is feeling a bit sheepish right now, because you know, you, you kind of do rely on ice. I too spent my entire college career for all five years getting in an ice bath almost every single day um, and did it many times throughout the rest of my life. So I'm, it definitely was interesting for me to hear that, that kind of all of that discomfort wasn't really doing me as much help as I thought it would be. Um, so I will recommend that you you read on through that, especially if you are someone who has kind of been doing this in the past. Um, just before we move on, you don't have to go into too much detail because again, I want people to check it out. Cryotherapy, let's say yes or no. Yeah. Well, I will say that it was quite a rush and I can understand the appeal. Um, but in terms of 
being something that's going to improve your recovery, I didn't find much evidence of that. So mm. I think it's a pass. Yeah, because I think that one is a very popular one right now that people are kind of all over. The same with the infrared sauna. You did go into yeah. that one um, as well. All right. So one I wanted to talk about, which is a constant um, argument back and forth, but comes about with a simple answer, which I think is worth mentioning, is fuel. Uh, what to eat post-workout or you know, to help your body recover. Um, this is one that I'm sure many people listening are worrying about. Before we get into what you found about it, I wanted to mention the fact that you talked about the dangers of under eating, but then how we are also told that the, you know, when it comes to overeating, you're carrying extra weight, that's going to slow you down, make you more injury prone, all these kind of things. Now, I obviously know the dangers of under eating. I think right. my story made that pretty clear, but Tell us about what you found when it came to that, because um, it's an important point and it's something we tend to overthink with regards to how whether you're under or overeating. Yeah, I think this is a really important point, and particularly for runners who tend to really be fixated on staying light and lean. And there's obviously benefits to that. But what I found is that under fueling can really impair your recovery mm -hmm. and it can harm your performance. And so, you know, it's really to your detriment to restrict energy intake and restrict calories to the point where right. you're you're not replenishing. And so that can be really detrimental. I, I don't think that this has been recognized to the extent that it should yes. for a while. And particularly, I think that a lot of the emphasis over the years has been on women when mm -hmm. in fact, this is just as common in men. And that's why, you know, they used to call this the female triad. Mm -hmm. Now it's called REDS, which is... Relative maybe your, energy deficiency syndrome. syndrome. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's partially an acknowledgement that it also affects men and is just as important for them. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, some of the symptoms obviously may be a little bit different. Men won't stop getting their periods, but, <laughs> but uh, it, it's important. And so, yeah, refueling and fueling, you know, making sure that you are properly fueled for your, your workouts to begin with and your training and, and races is really important. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And I will encourage people to, again, go back a few episodes to episode 99. Listen to the Rini McGregor episode. She talked about um, Red S in detail and also gave, you mentioned some symptoms there, um, Christy, and some many that men and women will have uh, in addition to the regular women one of just amenorrhea. Um, but uh, she talked about gut health, how people mm -hmm. who are under eating, they may not you know, think that they are under eating because they are quote unquote a normal weight, but they might constantly have an upset stomach. And that's, you know, a huge red flag that you're not really taking in enough um, because you're, you know, and your gut is constantly fighting itself and giving you an upset stomach. So there are many symptoms that you may not know of. So if you haven't listened to that episode, be sure to go back to that one, episode 99. Now, I wanted to wrap up this section with, I loved what you kind of uh, said at the end, which was your um, final kind of point with fueling and eating enough was eat kind of whatever you crave, as long as it has calories and, and you know, good nutrients and your diet is generally varied with, with good quality foods in it overall. In that moment, after a workout or a race, you can kind of essentially eat what you, whatever you want. So tell us, you know, tell us your version of that, because I think it is important. We all get caught up in trying to find the perfect recovery meal. Yeah, I think we've sort of been sold, and I do mean sold, you know, this, this idea that there's this absolute optimum perfect fuel that we can do, or if we just eat the exact right nutrient or that there's some sort of superfood or super nutrient that's going to make everything right. And what I found looking at the research is that, you know, this stuff doesn't really exist. It, look, nutrition is really important and I'm not at all saying that it's not and you need to eat healthy food. Um, of course, determining what's healthy gets really tricky. I wrote a story for 538. I think the title was something like, you can't trust what you read about nutrition. And it, it was sort of a look at nutrition studies. And really the takeaway from that is that it's really hard for us to know, you know, we want to know how much, you know, of this particular food or nutrient do I need? You know, so for instance, do blueberries prevent cancer or, you know, make us healthier and things like that. But the studies aren't really capable of answering providing answers at that level of detail. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of, we do know that, you know, eating whole foods, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, things like that are good for us. Um, probably, you know, the more, more processed food is, is probably not as healthy, 
But it's also true that, you know, our bodies are, when we're training hard, they're basically these furnaces and they really need calories and they need Mm -hmm. protein, you know, they need carbs. And so, you know, it doesn't matter that much if it's coming from one source or another, which is not to say that there aren't, I'm not saying that everyone should go eat Twinkies or anything like that, but just that we've sort of, we've almost turned food into its own source of stress. Yes. Um, And I've seen this so much in athletes where, you know, they're so worried about food and making sure they're eating exactly the right thing to where, you know, food is no longer something to be enjoyed. It's no longer a source of sort of replenishment and rejuvenation and feeling good. And making memories. Yeah. Right. Right. And so, you know, I have an example in the book of NBA players are really in love with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches Mm -hmm. and they love PB and J's. And you know what? That's a, that's, it's a great snack. It's got yeah. protein. It's got some fat. It's got carbs. Like it's, it's a good, you know, it, it's not a bad thing, but at one point, one of the teams had a nutritionist who came on or a, a you know performance person who said, Oh, there's too much sugar in that, that jelly. You know, so we're going to take the PB and J's away. And yeah, that's just silly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we should not be afraid of foods. Um, if you look around the world at athletes from different countries, they're eating much different things and yeah. still performing well. So the idea that there's this absolute perfect magical formula yeah. or magical food is sort of ridiculous. And I think the other thing to, to keep in mind here is that a lot of the the foods and a lot of the products that are marketed to athletes, particularly post post exercise stuff, is really highly processed. So mm-hmm. yeah, you, know, you have people who who are on the one hand are saying, "Well, I only eat you know at Whole Foods, and I want to eat these Whole Food things and fruits and vegetables," but then they're eating these like really processed um, products, and that's just there's no need for that. You know, yeah. it's okay to eat real food. Don't be afraid of it. Yeah, but also at the same time, don't feel guilty. Like I I remember being a few times in the past where I was maybe like in Indiana visiting a family friend and we'd gone, she went, like the lady I was staying with wanted to go to this restaurant and it only offered this really like fried, you know, just this buffet of all kinds of foods that I wouldn't usually touch. And I remember feeling Mm -hmm. like so much anxiety about like, I don't want to eat that food. I don't want to put it in my body. And it was stressing me out. But really Mm -hmm. I should have just said, you know what? just going to make the best of the situation, enjoy this food that I don't normally eat. And, you know, it's fine. It's not going to, one meal isn't going to make a difference. So um, I'm glad you mentioned that in that way. And and fueling is such an important point. But I think, as you mentioned, we need to, you know, simplify it. It doesn't need to be something that we overthink so much. And again, I want to encourage listeners, go back to that episode a few weeks ago with Rini. So anything Mm -hmm. else you want to add to that? Yeah. So I just, I also want to say, I would love for us to stop the food shaming too. And like, Mm. you know, picking out, you know, this food's good and that food's bad. And particularly I was talking to a runner recently who was, she had just been home. She was from the Midwest and I can't remember the food now, but she had had a meal that was, you know, she perceived to be unhealthy. I don't know that it was um, all fried, like the meal you're talking about, but just something. And I said, wait a second, you know, stop. That's, that's your comfort food. This is a meal cooked by your mother. It's a Midwestern specialty, whatever. And like, maybe it's not the thing that you want to be eating all the time, but chances are, it's not something that's going to hurt you for one meal. It probably has like some good nutrients and whatever. And so I think that we just need to get away from this idea that foods are good or bad, or they make us good or bad people. Yes. And just sort of, I mean, I think the best thing a runner can do about food is relax about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. For sure. And and thank you for bringing that up. I think that is important, particularly as we are runners who like to control things. Um, It's not easy to do, but the more you can do it, the more you will enjoy your food and the more you will just feel better because that's less stress in your life. Right. (laughs) Okay. So there was plenty of other different topics that you talked about, you know, um, floating, which I have done myself, Mm -hmm. didn't personally like that that much. I just felt it was a bit, I don't know, for me, it just kind of angered me because I just wanted it to be over with and then I'd like Mm -hmm. completed it. Um, Uh You also, you know, had some ones like snake oil, uh, supplements, many other different things that I want to um, have the readers go get themselves a copy of Good To Go to to read themselves. But one interesting thing I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned quite a few, you know, elite runners who you've kind of followed and and interviewed and learned from in this book. Um, The two that come to mind are Mike Wardian and Camille Heron. 
Uh, first, I want to talk about Mike. You talked mm-hmm. about um, during, I can't remember what the challenge he was doing, but it was some kind of, was it seven marathons, seven yeah, continents? Yeah, seven, seven marathons, seven continents, seven, seven days, days, I yeah. believe. In fact, I think he, I just got a note from him a couple of days ago. I think he's either embarking on it or going, It's hap- he's doing it again and he oh, really? may be out on it right now. <laughs> yeah. So follow him on social okay. media. To, yeah, Mike's to a great person to that. follow. Yeah. But then with that, yeah. you've talked about, Dealing with the travel, he used meditation, which is something I wouldn't have really thought about. But tell us about what you found with that. Yeah. So this this challenge that he did, so seven marathons, seven continents in seven days. I mean, just think about that. Like mm-hmm. basically they are running and then they are traveling. That is literally pretty much all. Well, and he's running them do. fast as well. I think he was right. running like 240-ish, wasn't he, for most of them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was. It was quite incredible. And so, you know, travel is extremely stressful. And I think this is something that a lot of athletes don't give enough sort of attention to or recognition. You know, we think, oh, it's a travel day and resting, but no, you're not resting if you're traveling. And so, you know, he found that it was hard for him. I mean, look, I think most of us have found that it's hard to sleep on a plane, right? Mm-hmm. And so he was, you know, trying to sleep, that's hard, trying to just relax and recover. And so he turned to an app that he was using to meditate and found that it worked really well for him. And in fact, the last time I had talked to him about this, he was doing it um, at home too, in sort of his everyday life as well, and finding that it was helpful just for, again, reducing stress, which is an important part of the recovery process. Mm-hmm. And can you tell us which app it was? Um, I can't recall. I think it's in the book. Okay. All right. Then you guys will have to go to yeah. go look to find out. Um, all right. And then Camille, uh, now Camille is someone that you mentioned many times throughout the book as someone who yeah. kind of does the right things. So tell us why Camille to you kind of became the representation of, of good recovery essentially. Yeah. So First of all, I'll just say that Camille has sort of a supernatural ability to recover. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think it's just, I mean, her practices and all this are good, but she's also clearly someone, I mean, she can do back-to-back marathons quite fast and feeling good and not getting injured, which a lot of, you know, I think that that's a rare, yes. a rare thing. Yeah, so yeah. we'll just acknowledge that. Um, but I think that her approach just really embodies, I think, the message that I'm trying to get across with this book, which is that, you know, don't overthink it, pay attention to your body, really listen. You know, and she's just someone who's very, very good at listening to what her body's saying. If she feels tired, she'll cut her workout short. After an event, she'll take a little bit of time off, but then she'll just kind of pay attention to how she's feeling and use that as her guide rather than planning something out in advance on this spreadsheet or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really, you know, in the end, what I realized was the key to recovery is learning to read your body and also not sweating the small stuff. You know, she's really um, keen to get enough sleep. You know, she pays attention to that. She's sure to get enough fuel. Um, You know, she just set a world record in the hundred mile run Mm -hmm. around a track, which I mean, just, just completing that is like beyond my imagination. Yeah. It makes me feel like physically (laughs) sick to like imagine doing that. It's amazing. But you know, she was eating Taco Bell during the middle of it because that's what she was craving and it worked. And like, I, th- again, this is like, let's stop the, the food shaming. Like that's pretty good nutrients. I mean, she got what she needed and it worked for her. So, you know, she could have eaten, you know, some other thing, but that worked. And so, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't overthink it. She yeah. goes to an event and, you know, she's hungry. She eats what she can get and she's not searching high and low for this special Thing that may be hard to get in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and she is someone who, you know, hasn't just done this once. She's done it over and over again, always impressing us with things that she's done. Just an amazing, amazing runner, amazing person. And, um, you know, just was really cool to kind of see that and have you bring that to our attention because I had noticed it subconsciously, but bringing it to the forefront. I mean, she truly is someone that that embodies that. And it was wonderful to hear. And you mentioned sleep. Now, this is probably the most important recovery tool of all, but it's one that we are not so good at actually following through on. So tell us just how important you found sleep to be. Oh, it's the most important factor in recovery. I mean, it's it's the number two, number one, two, three, four. I mean, it really, like everything else is just minuscule by comparison. If you're not getting enough sleep, there's just no way your recovery will be optimal. And sleep is really where your body is doing all, you know, 
making all these repairs, uh, doing all of the physical, you know, physiological recovery that you need because it's not being taxed with other things. And mm-hmm. so you just really, I think if there's one thing that runners can do to sort of have a uh, healthy habits and performance enhancing lifestyle is to just emphasize sleep. And I say emphasize because, you know, good sleep doesn't just happen on its own. We all mm-hmm. have busy lives these days. It's really easy to get sucked into like staying up too late or getting up too early. And it really requires priority it and making it something that you just like, you're not going to skip your, your run. You're not going to skimp out on sleep either. Mm-hmm. And I think I, that is something I plan on addressing again. I've done it in the past on another podcast episode, because you mentioned we have very busy lives, Yeah, but it is difficult sometimes, even if you're not staying up to not lie in bed and kind of run over all the things you've got to do or the things that you've done. Um, but, you know, making sure that you have, do carve some time out to kind of decompress before bed or even write out a list of things that you've got to do tomorrow or keep a list by your bed so that if you think of something in the night, you can just write it down. And who cares if it doesn't yeah. actually, you can't see what you're writing and it doesn't make any sense. It just gets it out of your head so that you can yeah. kind of, you know, just relax. And and even just sometimes um, I found just kind of lying there as if I'm asleep like that, that is enough to kind of bring me down to, to just relax enough to do it rather than thinking I've got to sleep. I've got to sleep. And that's the tricky thing here. The Absolutely. more pressure you put on it, the less likely it is will, will happen. But Absolutely. I, I do and intend I, I on addressing whole, this. I do have, the book has a whole chapter on sleep mm-hmm. and in it, there are a few tips and some really good strategies yeah, that I've definitely. actually used myself. And I had a friend who was uh, really struggling with insomnia for a while. And I, I told her a few of those things that I mentioned in the book. I think one of them is turning the clock away so that you can't see it. And she said, oh, I, I need to see it. I said, no, you don't turn it away. And it actually worked. So, mm. um, but there's some pretty basic things that you can do that will help. And those are all discussed in the book. Yeah. So worth a try. Um, and, uh, definitely something that is worth mentioning and worth reading that chapter alone, just because it's so, so crucial to us. Okay. So to wrap up here, um, the big question everyone is probably wondering, so we've mentioned sleep being the uh-huh. most important. If you had to pick two others, which two things would you say? I know you obviously have said um, that it's individual, mm-hmm. but if you were to suggest to people, be it psychological reasons like placebo effect or or not, two others that people could incorporate that would give them kind of the best chance of recovery, what would it be? Yeah. So I think there's two things I would say. One is find a way to reduce the stress in your life. Mm -hmm. And I hate to keep saying it's individual, it's individual, but you know, that psychological stress and life stress is really, really important. And it's something that is detrimental to recovery. And Mm -hmm. until you address it, you're, you won't be getting recovery completely right. So find a way, whether it's meditation, you know, is one thing that people use, maybe it's just addressing some of the things going on in your life. That's going to be individual, but some way to, you know, reduce that stress and to manage it. I mean, we cannot eliminate the stresses in our lives, but we can figure out ways to manage them. And I have a whole chapter in the book about the psychological side of stuff. And there are some tips and some strategies in there um, that are described. So that's one. And then I think the other thing would just be to not just pay attention and, you know, to your body and try to understand the signals that it's giving you about being recovered or not, but to find some kind of recovery ritual that will work Mm. for you. And by ritual, I mean something that you do that sort of signaling to both your mind and body that, okay, it's time to unwind. It's time to relax. So it may be, you know, some people really like those pneumatic compression pants those can be fine. It's a a chance to put your feet up where you're not running around and you're relaxing. Maybe it's a massage. Maybe it's just a a hot bath. It doesn't matter, but it's something that you do. And that is sort of you deciding, okay, this is time for me to relax Mm -hmm. and I'm going to have some downtime. It's not just physical, but also psychological. So find that sweet spot for yourself. Yeah. And I I don't know if you agree with this, but you know, as Steve and I do have Bailey and, you know, for me being home with her all day and it's quite intense um, for me right now, that is just switching on a mindless TV show at like, 9 p.m. until 10 p.m. or even 9.30, just 30 minutes of just watching mm-hmm. something mindless, like something that is so, you know, one of those TV shows that's just so unrealistic, but you're just like, whatever, like, 
you know, it could be playing, you could be yeah. paying attention or not, put the phone away and just kind of zone mm-hmm. out. I find that that helps. Yeah. So even if it's something that simple or you want to do your phone rolling while you're doing that, just something, mm-hmm. I think that's a great point to, to round up here with. So Christy, thank you so much for that. We are just going to take a moment to thank our sponsor and then we'll be back with the Running for All Four. No ad today, my friends. Instead, I wanted to ask you if you would do me a huge favor. In 2019, I'm working hard to bring you the things that are actually helpful for you, brands you actually want to hear from and learn from. And the best way that I can do that is to actually hear it from you. I'm not saying that the brands in the past haven't matched up. You know that that's something that's really important to me. I'm just saying I want to think about you moving forward. I've actually not conducted a podcast survey in years and I thought it was about time. I want to get to know you better and if you would like to be in a focus group with me, we can talk about it even more than this survey too. I'd really appreciate it if you could go to tinamuir.com forward slash survey to fill it out and help me out. It won't take long, just a few minutes, but it will make this podcast more enjoyable for you in the future. Oh, and I know I said no ad, but just a reminder in case you forgot, because if you are like me listening to this while you run or do something else, because hello, multitasking, you may have forgotten, like I often do, about things that you need to remind yourself to do. Anyway, my book, Overcoming Amenorrhea, is now out and I'd love your support if you could purchase a copy. And you can get yourself a copy by visiting tinamuir.com forward slash book. And for all these links I mentioned, because remember, your hands are busy, you're doing something, be sure to go visit the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 101. Easy to remember. Thanks so much, my friends. All right, Christy, four more questions for you, starting with one piece of advice for life. So my piece of advice is to figure out what you want to do and then do it. Love and by it. that, I mean, to figure out what's going to get you up in the morning and make you feel passionate about what you're doing in your life. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. What about one person to follow on social media? Well, I feel like I would be remiss if I did not recommend Camille Heron because yeah, yeah. she is so amazing. And she's also, so in addition to being so great at recovery, she's also probably one of the most optimistic and cheerful people I've ever yes. met. And so she's just a constant source of inspiration for me. Yeah, she is wonderful. And I definitely agree. Camille is a great person to follow. I, I already follow her as well. How would you like to be remembered on this podcast? Um, I think I'd like to be remembered as being open-minded, but also someone who's fun to go running with. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. (laughs) Um, Not that I've run with you, but I can imagine you would be fun to run with. (laughs) Um, I'll have to do it sometime. Yeah, I would love that. Um, And finally, what do you tell yourself on the start line of a race? Relax. Mm. Has that changed since reading the book or since researching? You know, one of the things that I've kind of realized while writing the book is that my high school cross country and track coach was amazing and so great. And he used to tell me that on the starting line, just relax. And he'd sort of like, you know, pat me on the shoulder. Like, I mean, in a sort of a, a this sounds more patronizing than it was, but just like, you, you know, he really yeah. conveyed the sense of like, I believe in you and you're yeah, ready for yeah. this and just relax. And I've always, and I think this is something that I really took from that from high school on, which, you know, it's more than a few years ago now, just staying relaxed. Mm-hmm. And also having the confidence, you know, knowing that I'm prepared. Love that. That's simple and it's effective. So yeah. Christy, so we've mentioned the book a few times, uh, Good to yeah. Go, which can be found in all the major, uh, all the usual spots, I guess. And uh, where else can people find you if they are interested in following along with you in the future? Sure. So my website is my name, com, And I'm on Twitter, pretty active there. My my call sign there is Craig Crest. That's C-R-A-G-C-R-E-S-T. It's actually a place name. It's mm-hmm. my favorite trail run. So it's like Tell us that last the, time you the were here. Yeah. Craggy Crest. Yeah. So people ask me, what is that? It's like, oh, it's this beautiful place. Yep. And those two are the main ones? Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Great. Um, I, should, I should mention one other thing. So uh, end of this month, this month that just turned to February now, mm-hmm. um, I am launching a new podcast, oh, um, which is a little bit of a departure. It's called oh. Emerging Form, and it okay. is um, a podcast about the creative process. And Ooh. so my co-host is a poet. She's a good friend of mine. And so oh, it's the cool. two of us talking about creative conundrums and, and you know, the creative process with all its pitfalls and joys and anguish and all of that. And every episode we 
tackle a particular topic. And then at the end, we bring on a special guest to help us answer a few questions about it. And I think there's one episode, um, I think it's going to be the second episode um, that might be of interest to runners is about talent. And so we talk about Mm. sort of, is talent necessary? Can you overcome a lack of talent? And so although we are talking about it sort of in the creative domain, I think that it applies to running too. And in fact, running does come up in our discussion. So all right. Well, thank you. What is the name of it? Emerging Form. Okay, and Emerging Form. Emergingform.com is where you can find it soon. Okay, all right. I will put links in the show notes. These will be up and ready by the time you are listening to this. So go check the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash, I didn't figure this out, one, two, episode 102. So tinamuir.com forward slash episode 102. Christy, thank you so much for sharing this insight with us for being here today for writing this book and actually doing some of the work for us to actually know you know what what you found what the science finds and you know what the limitations of the science are so I appreciate you I appreciate all that you've done and and thank you so much all right thank you pleasure to be here My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. I absolutely love it when someone totally unbiased writes a book on something that genuinely confuses and overwhelms me. I thought this was fascinating and well done to Christy for taking the time to go through it so the rest of us can kind of essentially reap the rewards of what she found. You can find links to everything we talked about today in the show notes, including her book and the podcast survey I referred to at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 102. And remember, if you've already read my book, Overcoming a Minaria, and you could leave a review on Amazon, that would make me so very happy. What else makes me happy? Seeing your screenshots on social media with the thoughts of these podcast episodes. I see every single one and reply to every single one. So you make me feel like I'm on the right track when you share them and just say how excited you are by them. So thank you so much. Next week, we're going to talk all about feet. But wait, 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 don't go yet. (laughs) This is going to blow your mind. Seriously, this isn't about a company trying to make some money, but genuinely someone who wants to help us, who wants to make sure there are no more runner bunions. And yes, that is possible. And we also have many other foot issues that he wants to clear up. This is going to be fascinating. So be ready for Dr. Ray McClanahan and subscribe to this podcast, The Running For Your Podcast, so it comes right to your podcast player when it comes out next week. Until then, have a great week. Thanks for listening to The Running For Real Podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.